you actually identified, I think, a lot of the environmental factors. One that we haven't talked about is portion sizes. So have any of you seen um, the movie related to McDonald's and portion sizes, Super Size Me? Yeah. So obviously that's a little sensationalized, but you get the idea that portion sizes have changed dramatically over the course of time. And you know, you go to a, a store and for 10 cents extra, you can triple the value of the meal. And so a lot of people, it, it makes a lot of sense. And there have been a lot of studies looking at when people are served larger portions over time, they're actually gonna consume more food. And even with children, when you serve a child a larger portion, that can lead to increased consumption of calories. So there's definitely a role of portion sizes. This refers to the built environment, speaks to things like, um, talked about access to food stores, but also something as simple as, um, somebody mentioned, a couple of you mentioned physical inactivity. Okay, so now imagine you're trying to promote physical activity for children or adults, but the child lives in an impoverished neighborhood with um, no uh, sidewalks and a lot of community violence and is afraid to leave their house because they're afraid of being exposed to a violent crime. They don't have enough money to go to a gym and their schools have eliminated physical activity. So now there are these characteristics of that built environment that are gonna make it more difficult for the individual to engage in something like physical activity. So this is, I don't know if you guys can see this, picture down here, probably some of you can, but it's a picture of a, um, a gym and it has stairs in the middle, but then on each side it has an escalator. So again, this idea that we also may be <coughs> making it more difficult to engage in everyday physical activity. We also know that social factors play a role. So for people to try to change, it's very difficult for people to try to change their own eating behaviors in isolation. And maybe some of you have had the experience of you try, like if you go out with a certain group of friends, you might be more likely to eat a certain thing or to drink a certain thing or to do other behaviors. Your behaviors are gonna be influenced by the people around you. It's the same thing with eating behaviors. And then stressors that can come from the social environment. So that can be, again, could be related to anything from community violence to um, caregiver stress, so the stress of caring for different people, any sort of stress can make it more difficult to stick with a particular type of behavior. So if you all think about, let's say, pick a behavior in your mind that you try to stick to, like a healthy behavior, you don't have to share it, but it could be exercising, it could be sleeping more, whatever it may be. Now imagine what happens to that behavior when you're stressed. So how much more junk food do you eat during finals week? How much more do you do all these bad things during finals week as compared to weeks when maybe it's not finals week or midterms? Same idea, when people are experiencing more stress, it can be more difficult to engage in healthy behaviors. Did you have a question back there? Uh, nah. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <coughs> so, this comes back to this idea that a lot of times people say, well, eating behavior, and even people that I've worked with who are trying to change their eating behavior, they say, well, it's just about willpower. And yes, again, there are certain behavioral or psychological factors that can affect someone's ability to change their eating behavior, but that doesn't occur in a vacuum. So there are other things like these food deserts or mindless eating because you're in an environment that doesn't support. How many of you in the past week have sat down and eaten a meal and only focused on eating? Raise your hand. Nothing else. No phone, no talking, no watching TV, no reading, no studying. All that you focused on was eating. Okay, so what, do you mind saying what you were doing and where it was? I just get in the zone when I eat. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's, that's very unusual. That's good. Were you by yourself? Huh? Were you by yourself? No. Okay, so you were with other people and yeah. you were just focusing on eating. Yeah. Okay. What okay, what about you? Uh, I was, it was actually today. I was by myself after class, leaving the comm center, just wanted to grab something to eat, kind of wake up in the morning. Okay. Before I, you know, start the rest of my day. Okay. 
So you can see out of this class of, I don't know how many, how many people are in the class, about 15, 20, yeah, somewhere around there. So two people in the past week have had an occasion where they just focused on eating. So that's this idea of mindful versus mindless eating. And when we're not paying attention to eating, you may eat more, you may eat more unhealthy foods. So it's another factor. So there are lots of different things that contribute to unhealthy eating, not just someone's, quote, willpower. And as I mentioned, there are definitely behavioral factors that contribute to weight difficulties. So we talk about the mindless or unintentional eating. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed or ever had the experience of sitting down in front of the TV or while you're studying. I know I do it while I'm working and the next thing you know, whatever you started eating is gone and you don't really remember eating the whole thing. Did that ever happen to anybody? <laughs> okay, so that's an example of mindless eating. So you're much more likely to eat more. Um, unhelpful eating patterns could be things like, you know, especially when people are really stressed, you're really busy. Many of you realize, oh my gosh, I haven't eaten for the past eight hours. Anyone ever, that ever happened to anybody? Okay, raise your hand. If you've ever gone and you realize, oh, I didn't eat for the past however many hours. And then when you realize that, how do you feel? <coughs> Hungry. Really hungry. <laughs> and <laughs> what do you eat? Crap. <coughs> right, whatever. Doesn't really matter. So unhelpful eating patterns like skipping meals make, can make people more vulnerable to making unhealthy choices. This even connects back to this education because a lot of times people aren't aware of some of these things and aren't aware that by changing some of these things they can change their eating patterns. So we talked about sedentary behaviors, problem solving is kind of the idea that um, if someone is faced with a difficult situation, they don't really know how to address it. So if they're having trouble figuring out how to get healthy food, for example, they can't really figure it out and they might just go with the easiest, what seems to be the easiest solution. And then there's also some evidence now that they're, um, how can I say this? Some people are more sensitive to um, things like advertisements for certain foods, or some people are going to respond differently to high-fat, high-sugar foods than others. So there's some individual differences there, too. So shifting gears now to thinking about what or how we do this. Um, one thing I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, but I think it's important to acknowledge is that there are a lot of things that should be done to address both the prevention of weight difficulties from the beginning. So these are some of the things that you've seen in terms of making changes to school lunches, for example, or targeting advertising, to, especially advertising to children. So prevention is just as important, if not more important, than treatment. And again, focusing very much on the environmental factors. So there are lots of things that are being done at a policy level or addressing the built environment, making grocery stores available. And then what we do here, what I'll spend a little bit more time talking about, is helping treating the individuals themselves. So treating individuals who have obesity or who have weight difficulties. So this is a, um, a general summary of what this particular treatment, which we call behavioral weight loss, looks like. Um, these are the main components. It's not this cookie cutter, but this is kind of generally what you'll see. There's a lot of research supporting the effectiveness of this type of treatment or this type of approach. Some of it might seem quite straightforward and self-explanatory, but again, what we're doing is we're helping people learn new behaviors. And I'll go through some of these in more detail. I'll go through self-monitoring in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, setting goals is just helping people. Sometimes it can feel very overwhelming if a person says, I want to lose 40 pounds. So for example, helping them set more achievable goals and working toward those goals. Like we talked about problem solving, stimulus control, I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, coping relates to, remember I mentioned that things like stress can make it more difficult for people to change their eating behaviors. So we may help people learn new strategies for coping with stress. 
And then relapse prevention refers to, okay, once, you, once you're in treatment, you've lost some weight, you've changed your eating behaviors, now how do you maintain that? So those are the general categories, and as I mentioned, I'll go through a couple of them in more detail. In terms of the structure, it's usually between 12 to 20 weeks uh, for about 50 minutes a week. We do weigh people weekly and track their weight over time, and what that does is that helps people make that connection between the behaviors that they're changing and the changes in their weight. There's some education, nutrition education, but oftentimes this is not done by dietitians. So we'll, we might refer people out to a dietitian for more specific information. We um, get people to begin to creatively develop physical activity plans, really individualizing that and working around what's available to them. Um, this refers to changing behaviors, behavior modification. And then uh, coming back to what you had mentioned <coughs> way back there, that there, are some, there might be some psychological factors contributing to some eating behaviors. So we might look at some eating, uh, some thinking patterns that might contribute to this. So for example, sometimes people might say, okay, I had a really good day on, on my diet. By the way, this is not a diet. We talk about it as a lifestyle change that's going to be maintained indefinitely. So some people might say, okay, I had a really good day on my diet. And then three, four o'clock rolls around. Maybe they went eight hours without eating. There's this big pizza in front of them and they eat five slices of pizza because they're really hungry. And then they think, I just blew my diet, so what the heck, I might as well just not even bother. And then they might go on and continue to make unhealthy choices. So that type of thinking pattern, like everything was perfect, but now that I blew it, I give up, that can make it really difficult to make healthy changes in the long term. So that's what I, does that make sense to everybody? That's what I mean by identify or modify unhelpful thinking patterns. Okay, so self-monitoring. So we ask people to write down very specifically everything that they consumed. So you can see specifically this dog's talking about how he ate two bowls of dog food, a sandwich, a crust, spaghetti, that fell on the floor, half of your cat food, wet tea bag, three bugs, and the inside of the sneaker. Um, and then the cat says, I'm going to need more information. So what we do is we really ask as specifically as possible, what is everything that you consume during the day? How many calories does that add up to? Because that's gonna help people recognize, kind of addresses that idea of portion sizes and portion distortion. To help people start to, to realize, oh, that one piece of pizza was actually not 200 calories, it was actually 600 calories. So self-monitoring is one piece. This is what it looks like. So we ask people to write specifically what they ate, how much, and the calories. Um, we also ask them sometimes to monitor their, their weight and their physical activity. And now there are lots of apps. So have any of you used apps to track your food intake or exercise or anything like that? Some of you. Yeah, so there are lots of apps available. Since this is a journalism class, there are also a lot of blogs that you could look into that and support forums for helping people monitor and make changes to their eating behaviors. So this is really important piece of 